final battle of the Revolutionary War, the blue-coated American forces, followed by their white-uniformed French allies, breached the outer defenses of the British, trapping them and making their position hopeless. The following morning, the British ended their fighting. General Washington and his aides drew up the terms of an unconditional surrender. An American and a French officer followed their red-coated British counterparts into this house to formally present them with Washington's terms. The British General Cornwallis had no choice but to accept. Washington retired to his beloved home, Mount Vernon, overlooking the Potomac River. A revered war hero and a country gentleman, but his service to his country was not yet over. A new constitution had been ratified, and he was called back to be the first president. He took the oath of office at Federal Hall in New York City, the nation's capital. The next 26 fateful years would test whether or not the revolutionary war heroes and other leaders could keep the states united, nurture a sound economy, and protect the infant nation from the great powers of Europe. Washington immediately appointed his trusted friend Alexander Hamilton Secretary of the Treasury. During the war, the two men had become close when Hamilton, in his early 20s, had served as one of Washington's personal secretaries with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After the war in New York City, Hamilton had become a successful lawyer and a power in politics, helped by his marriage into the wealthy and politically prominent Schuyler family. Now, as Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton, at 32, flamboyant, a gifted writer with a brilliant mind, was in complete contrast to the president. Washington, now 51, more soldier than scholar, had no profound conviction about what the social order should be in the new country. He was enormously influenced by Hamilton's ideas. The society which Hamilton envisioned for the United States would be modeled after England, where the wealthy, educated, and privileged ran the country, a government by an aristocracy of the landed gentry. Hamilton harbored a deep distrust of the common workers and people who owned no property and consequently had no right to vote. They might be incited to use force, he feared, to take over control of the federal government. The immediate problem confronting Hamilton was that the government needed money desperately just to operate. He requested that Congress raise revenue through import duties and domestic taxes. Congress quickly levied duties on imported goods widely used. Alcoholic beverages were subjected to heavy domestic taxes. These revenues contributed almost the only money the government received. Next, Hamilton submitted a report on the public credit, urging the federal government to redeem Revolutionary War bonds, now almost worthless, at their full original value. To pay soldiers when they were mustered out of service, bonds had been issued by both the states and the federal government. Hamilton wanted to redeem them in full, not part value, in order to establish confidence in the shaky new government and in its ability to repay future borrowings. However, most of the debt was held in northern states by speculators who roamed the back country buying up the bonds for a pittance from veterans who thought them worthless. To redeem the bonds at full value and enrich these northern speculators was at first denounced by the Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson of Virginia and his southern supporters. Then, in a political trade-off, Jefferson's southern faction agreed to vote for Hamilton's full payment of debts and, in exchange, moved the capital city and government offices from Federal Hall in New York City temporarily to Independence Hall in Philadelphia during the 1790s. 
and thereafter permanently to Washington, D.C., a new federal district next to Virginia. But it would be wrong to think of Jefferson simply as a politician. He was a man of towering intellect and principles. As an architect, he had designed his stately home in Monticello. As a political philosopher and talented author, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, that enduring manifesto of the rights of the common man. While minister to the court of Louis XVI at Versailles, France, he came to hate monarchy and the decadence beneath the glitter. Farmers, he believed, had all the best qualities, and an ideal society would be totally agricultural, an idea which then had considerable support. On the other hand, Hamilton wanted to model the new nation's economy after England, where manpower was replaced by water power during the Industrial Revolution, begun some 50 years before, making England the most powerful nation in the world. Accordingly, Hamilton sent a report on manufacturers to Congress, requesting the government to help finance an expansion of manufacturing, then located mostly in the North, to replace human-powered looms with water-powered textile mills. Quite naturally, the farmers in the rural South and Jefferson were against it. The report died. Nevertheless, Hamilton persisted privately, and with the support of businessmen, built at Patterson, New Jersey, the first planned factory town with workers' homes and manufacturing plants like this iron mill. The reason for choosing this site was the Great Falls of the Passaic River, which could supply tremendous water power. The project was ahead of its time, and after five years, shut down. The Riverside factories were empty and silent. Yet years later, Patterson would become a major industrial city which would require adequate banking services. Small banks like this were chartered by the state. Each printed its own paper money, the only kind in circulation. In most cases, not accepted at its marked value, be it a seven, six, or three dollar bill. To provide the country with a sound currency and a federal bank to transact all the government's business, Hamilton proposed establishing a privately owned Bank of the United States, like the Bank of England. Washington asked both Jefferson and Hamilton for their views on the bank. Jefferson opposed it because nothing in the Constitution actually authorized the bank, a strict interpretation. Otherwise, he feared the government would have a boundless field of power. Congress could charter the bank, Hamilton advised, because nothing in the Constitution said it couldn't. A broad interpretation, leading to more federal power. Washington decided Hamilton was right. At this time, the Supreme Court had not yet established its right to interpret the Constitution. Congress did charter the bank, swayed by the President's strong support, but for only 20 years. Discussions by a concerned public on the growing conflict between the political philosophies of Hamilton and Jefferson polarized the voters into the first political parties. The wealthy, mostly in the North, were attracted to the social order Washington and Hamilton were creating. Called Federalists, they believed that their privileged minority interests would best be protected by their control of a federal government which had broad powers. In foreign affairs, they were strongly pro-British. Supporting Jefferson were the common people in the crafts, in the trades, and poor farmers, especially in the South. These workers became known as Democrat Republicans. In foreign policy, they favored France and its recent revolution for the equality of man. The feuding between Hamilton and Jefferson even disrupted Washington's small cabinet. To restore harmony, Jefferson resigned as Secretary of State. In the National Gazette, a Jefferson-controlled newspaper, the monarchy federalism of Hamilton was attacked savagely and repeatedly. Unwilling to endure further vilification, Hamilton resigned as Secretary of the Treasury to again practice law in New York City but remained a close advisor to President Washington. 
The sudden arrival of citizen Edward Genet, minister of the New French Republic, at Charleston, South Carolina, posed the first of a series of threats to the United States from European powers. En route north to see President Washington, he stopped at villages to ask for volunteers to help France in her war against England. He reminded all of the Treaty of Alliance between the most Christian king of France and the United States of North America, made during the Revolutionary War, which had brought French forces to our aid. Now, at every stop, Genet demanded that Americans, as individuals, honor that treaty, even if their government wouldn't. He went too far when he commissioned 12 American ships as privateers in the French Navy, and they proceeded to capture some 80 British merchant vessels. Exasperated, Washington issued a proclamation of neutrality, abruptly stopping this American involvement. Fortunately, the Genet Affair resolved itself. A new radical French government dismissed him, temporarily relieving tension between the two countries. The next grave test of the new country's statesmen came not from abroad, but from farmers in western Pennsylvania. They had been stopped from shipping their products the easy way down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and around to the east coast or to the West Indies. The hostile Spanish had closed the port of New Orleans to American shipping since the Revolutionary War. Transporting their corn and other grain by wagon up and over the Allegheny Mountains and down to East Coast Market was virtually impossible because of poor roads. So instead, they distilled their corn or grain into whiskey and carried it on horseback over the mountains. They disdained to pay Hamilton's heavy tax on alcoholic beverages, believing it to actually be a tax on their grain. In fact, liquor on occasion came to be used as money in Pennsylvania, and a tax on it was rejected as outrageous. Armed farmers escorted federal tax collectors off their property. The tax revolt turned into the Whiskey Rebellion when farmers heard that federal troops were coming to enforce collection. Led by the war heroes, Generals Washington and Hamilton, the federal government had decided on a spectacular show of military strength to make it absolutely clear that no federal law could be flouted. The insurrection vanished. In Europe, the grim war England was waging against France cost them dearly in casualties. Their respect for the neutral rights of a small, weak country like the United States was secondary to winning that war. Because profitable markets in the British West Indies ports had been closed to American shipping since the Revolutionary War, American merchant ships built a thriving trade with the French West Indies. Without warning, hundreds of American merchant vessels bound for these French ports were boarded and seized by the British. They were trading with her enemy. This sorely aggravated other long-pestering disputes between the Americans and the British. During the Revolutionary War, estates which belonged to Americans loyal to England had been confiscated. The owners were simply served with eviction notices without the protection of the due process of law. The United States had agreed to compensate these loyalists, but still, 11 years later, the claims had not been paid. In retaliation, England continued to hold certain ports and trading posts within the United States, contrary to treaty terms. Also, the United States suspected that Great Britain had been trading arms for furs with the Indians and encouraging them to fight for their land being taken away by American settlers. To resolve these rankling old disputes and stop the seizure of neutral ships, John Jay, Supreme Court Chief Justice and a pro-English Federalist, was sent to England by Washington, but returned with precious little, a treaty denounced as a sellout. Congress ratified it, despite fierce opposition by Jefferson's Democrat-Republican Party. As agreed, England began to evacuate the forts she held, 
and in return, the United States would pay the dispossessed loyalists. However, England would still not allow neutral American ships in French ports, nor reopen her own ports in the West Indies to us, nor stop arming the Indians. So infuriated were the people throughout the nation that Jay was hanged in effigy. In Spain, the Jay Treaty worried the rulers as a step toward settling U.S.-British differences. They feared a war with England and wanted the United States as an ally. Washington, sensing this, began treaty negotiations with Spain to open the port of New Orleans, which had been closed to American shipping for more than a decade. By the resulting Treaty of San Lorenzo, Spain temporarily allowed American goods to be exported through New Orleans without paying duties. Also, the disputed boundary with Spanish Florida was settled, and each agreed to stop allowing Indian raids into the other's territory. In France, the Jay Treaty was seen as a betrayal by her former ally, the United States, in favor of her enemy, England. She responded angrily by seizing American ships in an undeclared naval war. At this time, Washington declined to run for a third term, and in farewell advised the nation, "'Tis our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world." Washington's vice president, John Adams, ran for the presidency against Thomas Jefferson. The voters were wooed, and Adams was narrowly elected. Under the electoral procedures of the time, Jefferson, of the opposite political party, became vice president. Adams quickly dispatched envoys to France, who strongly protested her seizure of American neutral ships. Congress, caught up in the nation's anti-French hysteria and readying for a full-scale war, passed the Alien and Sedition Act. Unquestionably, the acts infringed on the civil rights of individuals. Federal judges, mostly reactionary Federalists, began what Jefferson called a reign of terror against his followers. Under the Sedition Act, nine journalists and a congressman, all Democrat Republicans, were heavily fined and some jailed. Even Federalist Hamilton was alarmed and warned, let us not have tyranny. To save the country from dictatorship, Jefferson decided that he must run again for the presidency against Adams in 1800. The election was bitter and slanderous. A politic meddling clergy, as well as the press, vehemently denounced Jefferson, angered by his aversion to the church's control of religion. His serene reply is chiseled in stone today inside the Jefferson Memorial. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Jefferson won the election. However, Aaron Burr, an overly ambitious politician assumed to be running for vice president, received the same number of votes as Jefferson. In case of a tie vote in those days, the House of Representatives had to decide who would be president. Controlled by the Federalists, it preferred Burr. While 36 ballots were being taken during seven tenths days, there was a threat of civil disorder. It was only the influence of Hamilton, who detested Burr, his enemy in New York politics, even more than Jefferson, which finally swung the vote to Jefferson. To prevent this happening again, state legislatures ratified Amendment 12 to the Constitution, which required voting specifically for president and vice president. A staunch Federalist, John Marshall, was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by Adams just before he left office, a superb choice. He would preside over landmark decisions for the next 34 years which would grant strong powers to the federal government and make Hamilton's Federalist philosophy a reality, not Jefferson's. After taking office as president, Jefferson let the notorious Alien and Sedition Acts expire. In 1800, Napoleon defeated Spain and acquired from her the vast Louisiana Territory. Soon, New Orleans was again closed to American shipping, enraging Western farmers. To negotiate the reopening of the port, Jefferson sent a special envoy to Napoleon. Unexpectedly, Napoleon offered to sell all of the Louisiana Territory for only $15 million, urgently needing the money for his conquest of Europe. The size of the United States would be almost doubled. So golden was the opportunity that even without authorization, James Monroe and Robert Livingston signed the treaty, and Congress approved. 
In New Orleans, with full military honors, the French colors were lowered and replaced with a 15-star American flag. Never again could a foreign country close the port. Captain Meriwether Lewis was commissioned by President Jefferson to organize an expedition to explore the unknown northwest portion of the Purchase and beyond to the Pacific Ocean. Lewis's party included an Indian woman guide, Sacagawea, Captain Clark, and a small military force. Sacagawea proved invaluable in communicating with potentially hostile Indian tribes along the route. From St. Louis, the party made its way up the Missouri River, crossed over the Rocky Mountains, and down the Columbia River to the Pacific Ocean, which strengthened our claim to the Oregon Territory in dispute with England. Then scandal broke in Jefferson's administration. Vice President Burr decided to settle political scores with Hamilton by challenging him to a duel determined to kill him. Hamilton was mortally wounded. The next afternoon, General Alexander Hamilton died. Public outrage over Burr's seeming deliberate act of murder ended his political career. Aboard a keelboat, Burr, now out of office in disgrace and desperate, had gathered a small group of men with arms. They sailed down the Ohio and lower Mississippi rivers as far as Natchez, apparently determined to lead the lower Mississippi Valley into seceding from the United States. Deserted and betrayed by his followers, Burr, disguised as a workman, was captured by federal soldiers while trying to escape to Spanish Florida. After a long trial for high treason, he was acquitted, a politically motivated verdict which enraged Jefferson. The sounds of escalating war between France and England grew louder and again threatened our neutral rights. In Europe, Napoleon's armies were triumphant. On the high seas, the British Navy ruled supreme. American captains protested when British naval officers boarded their ships to question the crew and take off those who replied with an English Cockney accent. Sailors, they believed, were deserters from the British Navy. These seizures, called impressment, so inflamed anti-British feelings as to turn us towards a war with England rather than France. Impressment was considered an act of British barbarity and piracy. James Madison, Jefferson's Secretary of State, succeeded him as president. Henry Clay, the eloquent Speaker of the House, feeling the country was in a mood for war against England, scathingly denounced impressment and called for war, luring Congress with how easy the conquest of British Canada would be. We went to war against England. For two years, Americans suffered one disastrous defeat after another around the Great Lakes. The British even captured Washington, D.C. and set fire to the White House against only token American resistance. New Englanders and their merchant ships were idled by England's naval blockade. They grew adamantly opposed to Mr. Madison's war and lagged in contributing their share of money and supplies. What's more, New Englanders began smuggling beef into Canada to sell it to the British Army rather than deliver it to the Americans. When the British captured a port in nearby Maine and total defeat seemed imminent for the United States, Massachusetts sent out a call for the New England states to meet in convention at Hartford, Connecticut, where the talk was of secession and suing for a separate peace. Miraculously, an heroic defense of Fort McHenry at Baltimore following naval victories on the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain turned the tide. The Hartford Convention quietly disbanded. And England, preoccupied with Napoleon, was now agreeable to talk peace. The treaty negotiated at Ghent, Belgium, said nothing about neutral rights nor changes in the U.S.-Canadian border. But the new nation, which had fought England for the second time and survived, now commanded the respect of the great powers. 
The young nation with a newfound self-confidence turned away from Europe to look westward across a vast, undeveloped continent and could foresee a day when these United States would grow big enough to touch the Pacific Ocean.